This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Ah, uh, together again. Yes. You, me, Kenny B, just one big happy family, aren't we? Yeah. So good to have you along for another edition of the Farm Monitor. Yes, I am Ray D'Alessio. He is Kenny Bergamy. And once again, we think you're going to like what we have in store for you today. Yeah, ditto what he said. And coming up, unfortunately, a lot of people not liking this. Sunbelt Expo canceled for 2020. A difficult move for organizers. And in just a few minutes, we'll hear from Executive Director Chip Blaylock on what was all taken into consideration before making that decision. Also on the show, their job, making sure the lights remain on and the grass stays low. You'll also hear about their ties to the Newton County FFA chapter. And then later, just when you thought you knew all there is to know about poison ivy, hey, what do you know? Turns out there's much more to the plant than most people realize. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, you know, it's never easy building something from scratch, but that's exactly what the 2020 Georgia Farmer of the Year, Lee Nunn, has done in a short amount of time. Damon Jones takes a look at his expansive operation in Morgan County that encompasses many different sectors of agriculture. Despite working in the construction business out of college, Lee Nunn always knew that his heart belonged to farming. And at the age of 29, he finally chose to make that leap. It's a decision that 15 years later, he has no regrets about. I started in 2005 with, uh, with 50 acres and have steadily grown every year, um, every year since then. And I, to be honest, I, don't, I hope I never have to do anything else. I really, really enjoy it. It's, it's a great life, great family life. So, and great having your family with you alongside of you um, along this journey. And what a journey it's been as none has built that 50 acres into more than 1,500, growing some of the staples of Georgia agriculture. All that while also running two other successful businesses on the side. We grow cotton, corn, uh, soybeans, wheat, and winter peas. So yes, we are diversified on the, on the crops. No livestock um, on my farm, all, all crops. Um, I have a construction division of my farm where we build uh, agricultural type buildings, uh, pole barns, equestrian centers, weekend retreats, things like that. Um, also have a trucking division that uh, we use to do um, the truck all my own crops and grains. Those trucks have been plenty busy over the years and a big reason for those successful yields is a rotation schedule that hasn't planted the same crop on the same plot in back-to-back -back years. We diversify our crop rotations uh, to where we can manage crops a lot better. We'll do several hundred acres of, of one crop instead of doing my entire acreage in one crop. That allows us to be more efficient with our time and to do a better job, in my opinion, of managing that one crop at certain, certain times of the year. Thanks to that success and all the good work he's done within the industry, Nunn was recently named the 2020 Georgia Farmer of the Year. It's an honor that completely took him by surprise. To be honest, I was kind of shocked uh, at first, um, but after it kind of sank in, I was, I was humbled uh, to be chosen. Um, a lot of hard work we farmers do. Uh, glad that you know, glad to be noticed, and uh, but also glad to be a hope to be a voice for Georgia agriculture, you know, for this year. And as far as his secret to success, it's a mixture of plenty of hard work and a little bit of perseverance. Farming will set you back, and it it took me a few years in farming um, to to realize you're going to fail. There's going to be times you fail, and you have to learn how to accept that. And that was hard for me starting out was knowing that you will to a degree, be some degree of failure, you know, I guess. And I, I, uh, I learned to accept that and to, to push on another year. And many more years to come, as none believes that being a farmer was his calling in life. I, I always like growing things. I always like watching things grow. Um, and really, I, I like equipment. I like operating equipment. And even when I was in the construction business before I started farming uh, to the scale that we are now, um, I always like running equipment on the construction side and, and couple that with watching things grow. I mean, it was just a natural, natural fit. Reporting from Morgan County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, thank you, Damon. And unfortunately for Lee Nunn and other Southeastern State Farmer of the Year winners, 
there won't be the traditional gathering or festivities honoring them in 2020. That's because for the first time ever since the beginnings, the gates at Spencefield and Sunbelt Expo will be closed due to COVID-19. This comes after the board of directors voted unanimously to cancel the 43rd annual show, which was scheduled for October 20th through the 22nd. Sunbelt Executive Director Chip Blaylock explains what went into that difficult decision. With the trepidation of our exhibitors um, with COVID-19, which is, we totally understand, um, compared with the concern we have for our staff, our volunteers, our food vendors, and most importantly, our exhibitors and our attendees, there's just too much uncertainty with COVID-19 right now to press forward. And with respect to all those groups is why we went ahead and canceled. Plus the fact of having a show site that could have been half filled and buildings that were half filled. And is that really keeping with the tradition you know, of the Sunbelt Ag Expo. You put all of those things together, it led us to the gut-wrenching decision to cancel the show for this year. In the age of social media, information can spread rather quickly, and all too often it's bad information, especially when it comes to agriculture. Which is why one young farming and ranching couple has decided to show people life on the farm via social media in hopes of shedding a positive light on the industry. John Holcomb has the story. Welcome to Greengate Farm, a small poultry and cattle farm owned by Stephen and Tara Green. They're just like any other farm family, and thanks to the age of social media, hope to portray that to consumers by giving people a behind-the-scenes look, if you will, of living on a farm and producing food and fiber for the world. Last year at the Georgia Wife and Our Conference, we heard the farm babe talk, and she basically encouraged everybody to, we need to have more of a social media presence um, to just show people realities of farms and that we're families just like everybody else. Um, for months I fought it. I, I didn't know if I wanted to show our whole our lives on social media and then finally I just said, Stephen, I'm doing this. I feel like we're called to do this. We get nothing out of showing you our lives. The Greens are active GFB members that really believe in advocacy and really just want to be real with people and hope that the people they reach can learn something about agriculture along the way. My biggest thing just from day one is just wanting to, even if I can just show, I hope to reach more people, but even if I can just show one person um, that we are literally just like everybody else um, and then just show them we aren't trying to hide anything. It's, again, essentially, this is us. This is real life. Um, and I feel like it's important for people to know where their food comes from. If you follow them on social media, one thing you'll find pretty quickly is that aside from teaching others about ag, they're also teaching their daughter as well by raising her up on the farm and letting her help out as much as possible. There's a lot of life lessons to be learned through farming and what a better way to, to teach your little one. Um, I mean responsibility, uh, patience, that's a big thing. It, 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 it speaks for itself. I mean, for us personally, we both grew up on farms, and I feel like it teaches you, first of all, good work ethic. You know from the get-go where your food comes from, um, and just just having family time. I mean, you come out to the farm, and every night we come out here and we check chickens together as a family, or we try to, and you know, just going and seeing her love for the animals and just being out on the land is so awesome to me, and riding, just riding the foiler around and her just taking it all in. At the end of the day, their goal isn't to become famous. Their goal is to simply give you a look into the daily life of a farming operation and to show you that farmers are just like everyone else. We're not here to, to gain or benefit anything for our own personal interest. We're literally just here showing you guys the real thing. And if we can, like she said, if we can just change that one person, if there's uh, one misinterpretation of what's going on on poultry farms or even farms in general, if we can change that one mind and let them see exactly the truth, then that becomes a trickle effect onto all of their friends. So by impacting that one person, you know, we could be impacting 20 instantly. Reporting in Spalding County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, after the break, how sheep and a local FFA chapter continue to make good use of a very bright and efficient partnership.
So what do you get when you combine a bunch of sheep with solar energy? A very efficient partnership, that's what. Now in its third year, the partnership between Newton College and Career Academy FFA and Snapping Shoals EMC has created a sustainable approach to solar farm weed control. Come on. One of the main things about solar is one of the most valuable resources is the property. It's not the panels that are sitting on it, you have to buy the property. And so you have to maintain that. And instead of just leaving it laying here unused, we decided we would bring sheep out to maintain the facility. And if you look under this panel, they're doing exactly what they need to do. Uh, during the heat of the day, you have a shadow and that's where they graze during the heat of the day. And it's almost a defined line, plus they sleep under there. And the problem we have, if you don't maintain that, you have weeds, woody weeds, that can grow up in between these panels and do damage to the wires, the vines that will wrap around, and they'll shade the panels. So they're doing exactly what they need to do. Uh, some of the sheep belong to the school, some of them belong to Snapping Shoals EMC. Um, but that, that eliminates some of the herbicide application we have to put out here under the panels to keep the weeds down that make the panels productive. Um, also gives the students at the school an opportunity to come over here, work the sheep, and give them a place to house some of their sheep. Well, I grew up on a small farm not far from here, and so that is what I've always loved. And I was in the Newton County FFA, and I feel like I'm helping give back, and Snappy Shoals is giving back to our roots, really. Most of the sheep that we have here are Katahdin sheep, which are what are considered a hair type sheep. And the good thing about them, you don't have to shear them. Uh, and they're resistant to a lot of the internal parasites and a lot of the foot problems that you typically have in the humid, hot, southeastern climate. Now this particular sheep here, she is a retired club lamb. One of the FFAers would show her, uh, so when they get through with their shows, they can come out here and eat grass and live a long and happy life. But uh, most of our sheep are Katahdin, and they're a good breed for uh, this type of uh, facility uh, and in this climate. All right, turning from sheep to goats now, given its location exactly due east of the world's busiest airport, one can certainly understand the sound obstacles we face for this next story. However, it was all worth it, especially since we now get to bring you the story of Mary Rigdon, who owns and operates Decimal Place Farm. With great care and her attention to detail, Mary's goat cheese has been a smashing success at farmers markets and restaurants throughout Georgia. Now, according to Mary, her journey began while working as a USDA researcher studying not goats, but sheep. Part of the reason why I started into this was for a small family that I could be a stay-at-home mom for my children and we'd have the milk and the cheese and the vegetables from the garden. And because I had done the work with the sheep, I knew the fencing and the rotational grazing that was taught to me by a native New Zealander that I met through my research work. And I thought that that was a really great way to utilize the land again um, because sustainability is more of what I was interested in. When I moved back from Oklahoma and Texas, Atlanta was a boom town for construction. And so I started working that way and my girlfriends lived in Grant Park, so I found a place in Grant Park, and it was a tenth of an acre, and I had vegetables all around the outside perimeter of the yard. And when I started looking into the dairy goats, you'd go to the meetings, and folks would say, you know, how many goats do you have, and what's your farm name? And I finally just said, okay, it's Decimal Place Farm, and I'm marrying no goats at the moment. But I wanted to listen and hear other people's experiences with the goats because my research work had been with sheep. And so what was once a mere tenth of an acre is now 40 plus acres. Plenty of room for Mary's goats to graze and produce, resulting in what eventually becomes some of the best and healthiest cheeses on the market. When I make these cheeses, it's the good bacteria and organic vegetable rennet and the goat milk with the creamy goat cheese has no salt at all because I've got some folks that are heart patients and the other cheeses that I make don't have as much salt as a commercially produced cheese. The other thing I don't use is a mold inhibitor because I had some folks when I started that said that 
the mold inhibitor and some other cheeses had made them itch. And so the shelf life on my product is only three weeks. But the chefs in the Atlanta area and the folks that come to the Freedom Farmers Market on Saturday that's at the Carter Center have all been very supportive. And make no mistake about it, Mary is equally as supportive and grateful for her business partners, the goats themselves. The goats are more personable than the sheep that I was working with, but anything that utilizes poison ivy, privet, kudzu, honeysuckle, and is so efficient at that use is really important to me because I, I had looked around Georgia and seen the, the different wild places that seem to be so grown up. And I thought that the goats would do a good job of, of clearing the land and utilizing it to the best. These Sonnens come from the Son Valley in Switzerland, and a breed characteristic is that they're always white with stand-up ears. The Nubian has a, a long, floppy ear, and then there's another Alpine breed. So that I felt like this was calm and peaceful for my children. My daughter was two and a half when we moved to the farm and my son was born here. And the woman who had these goats here in Georgia was very knowledgeable. And I wanted to make sure and find someone who was a good mentor. Because there's, there's always that question that you haven't heard before that comes up. And Linda Pearson of Rock Point Farms did an excellent job of helping me through the, the various things that would happen with goats that you don't expect. Unique animals, aren't they? Well, hey, what do you know about poison ivy? More importantly, what don't you know about it? Up next, Georgia DNR's Kathy Church with some interesting fun facts about this fascinating plant. My name is Kathy Church, and welcome to the first installation of, hey, what do you know? <laughs> Where we quickly investigate random things in the woods of Northeast Georgia that are just interesting. And today's topic is poison ivy. Now, most people have had an experience with poison ivy. I know I have. But, <laughs> what do you know? It's not a true ivy. It's actually a member of the mango, cashew, and pistachio family. So people that are allergic to poison ivy sometimes have reactions to mango skins and raw cashew shells. But what's more interesting, 15 to 25% of people aren't allergic to poison ivy at all. I sure wish I was one of those people. Hence the gloves, not true. But since most people do have reactions to poison ivy, let's look at how to identify it. Poison ivy can actually grow as a shrub up to three feet tall or so. It can be a climbing vine like on this poplar right here behind me, all the way up. It can be a trailing vine, like what you see on the ground all the way around me. But no matter what, it's always going to have leaves of three with a little bit of red tinge there to its stem. Hence the phrase, leaves of three, let it be. Now, many people ask, what can be used to help alleviate a poison ivy rash? Well, there are plenty of over-the-counter things that you can use. But interestingly enough, nature provides its own. Jewelweed. Now, jewelweed can be identified Partly by its location, it's usually going to be found near water or in bottomlands, things like that. But in the late summer, it also makes beautiful red-orange lantern-shaped flowers, just gorgeous. But jewelweed is also known as touch-me-not because the seed pods, when they're ready to pop, can actually exhibit what we call explosive dehiscence, meaning the slightest touch causes those pods to pop open and blow their seeds all over the place. But Native Americans used to use a poultice of the leaves and the stems of the actual jewelweed to help to actually break down that poison ivy oil that makes you have the rash, the sap. The urushiol in the sap of the poison ivy plant is what actually makes humans itch. But it's not a defense mechanism. It's actually a way for that plant to hold on to water. But what's amazing is, is poison ivy is actually a really good wildlife forage. Deer, bear, even songbirds eat the leaves and the berries of the plant with absolutely no problem. Please do not try that at home. And do remember that even if that plant looks dead, it can still cause problems. So don't touch it, don't burn it, and you'll be just fine. So, hey, what do you know? Poison ivy is not really an ivy. It doesn't make everybody itch. 
It has its own natural cure and it's great wildlife food. Who knew? Hey, hope you found this interesting and keep a lookout for more. Hey, what do you know? Again, that was Kathy Church with Georgia DNR. Kathy, always full of great information. And hey, if you're a school or organization and would like Kathy to come and speak to your group about the many facts of Georgia wildlife, just shoot her an email at the address there on your screen, kathy.church at dnr.ga.gov. And as always, huge thanks to Georgia DNR for allowing us to share these great features with you. Finally this week, from our friends at the Georgia Forestry Commission, an educational piece on one of the tools they use to fight wildland fires. At first glance, it may look like something you see on the road every day, but upon further observation, it's actually very high tech. Today we're going to talk about the Type 6 engine. This is a Ford F550, a 2009 model. This is also it's a two-seater. This is one of our primary pieces of fire equipment. Now remember that our dozers are our first line equipment. This is more so for minimum suppression tactics, which is meaning roadside fires, um, mop up. Inside the truck here, we basically just have what we call, it's a mobile radio. This is our line of communication to our central response. And also it allows us to be able to communicate with other forces or other departments that's further away. When we do get out of this truck though, we also have what we call a portable radio, which is in a stationary pack that we actually put on our chest area. And as you can see, this engine is equipped with 400 gallons of water. It also, we have an extensive amount of additional hoses so that we can go up on side of the mountains or off the side of the road in woods and and create aggressive hose lays. Um, we have we have all of the all of the different forms of nozzles and adapters that meet NFPA standards. And on the back here, we have what we call it's a Honda V twin pump. This is our water supplier here. It controls the water. We also have a foam suppression system that's connected onto this truck as well, which we can actually lay foam if necessary. And as we continue to move around, as you'll see, we're also equipped with chainsaw if we have to cut any snags or dead trees, dead tree removal. We have some hand tools in here that that's also a part of our cachet as well. We have fire shelters, everything that you need, NFPA standards, this truck is equipped with. We carry this truck out to the schools to educate the kids and give them a walkthrough. Or a lot of times if we go and set up somewhere to hand out safety material, we utilize this truck to walk people around and, and explain to them what we do. And as fortunately, a lot of people have already seen this truck in action and they know it very well but this truck serves a multitude of purposes for us. Pretty cool, and hey, be sure to join us again next week as we continue to look at some of the tools used by the Georgia Forestry Commission to fight wildland fires. I had a chance to sit down with two pilots who literally fly just feet from the flames. Really neat perspective from their end. And the training these guys go through, absolutely incredible. So that's definitely something you're going to want to check out. And speaking of which, we're about to check out ourselves. Yeah, take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week. And as always, stay safe.